Ever since I can remember, my life in the Philippines was never meant to be permanent. There were always these talks about something called visas, something about passports, petitions, and citizenships. There were also talks about finally riding on a plane, finally playing in the snow, and my personal favorite, finally going to Disney World. Before, these talks were just mere words until these words became a reality. In the summer of 2009, my brother and I finally made it here, in the United States, the glorious land of opportunity. However, getting to this new life and this new country was a battle. But what I was not expecting was that the life ahead was going to have just as much hurdles as the life ahead. Let's start from the beginning. Back in 1961, my Lolo, my grandfather, decided to apply for a professional worker's visa to be able to work here. And after his visa was granted, he now had the ability to apply for visas for his family. And in 1981, him and his family finally moved here. And while they were here, they also applied to become green card holders, making them permanent residents. They now had the ability to fly back from their new home to their old home and vice versa. Now, let's fast forward to the 90s, when a wonderful and resilient woman by the name of Christina, my loving mother, shout out to my mom, <laughs> This, uh, decided to go back home to the Philippines to help with my grandfather's business. While back home, she also found a husband and then gave birth to two wonderful kids, one in 1995 and one in 1999, the one standing on the stage right now. In 2000, 2003, my mother decided to move back to the United States to be able to work and provide a better life for her family. However, due to many factors years later, my mom couldn't just apply for a visa just like my grandfather did back in the day. There's a more extensive and expensive process that was put into place. But before we get to that process, in 2004, my mother finally got her full-fledged American citizenship. And now, my brother, my father, and I finally had our chance. Now let's go back to that process. So, Look at here in this graphic to the left. This is the immigrant visa process as presented on the US Department of State website. And as you can see, there are literally 12 steps. The first is to submit a petition. A petition is pretty much you, know, you saying that you can provide for the people that you want to bring into the country. However, in order for a petition to be approved, the petitioner must be a United States citizen and the relationship between the petitioner and the petitionee must be biological. I know, that's a lot, right? After a petition has been approved, there are these 11 other steps that requires a lot of time, effort, money, and there's even interviews in there. And if you're asking yourself, yes, just like job interviews, I literally had to interview just to get into the country just like I would for an internship, which is insane. However, once you have your visa approved, there's still more. You have to go through multiple tests and checks to make sure that you're fit to go into the country, and then you also have to pretty much book your flight, and then have to plan out how you're going to move your life from one country to another. Spoiler alert, once you get to the US, you're not done yet. You also have to apply for a green card to become a permanent resident. And then you have to apply for your full-fledged American citizenship, which takes even more time, money, and effort. For the uh, full-fledged American citizenship, for those over the age of 18, there's even an exam for it. If you're asking yourself, yes, just like the ones we take here at schools about the United States and civics. And if you want, you can try it out for yourself. There's a BuzzFeed version of it online, so try it out after today's event and challenge yourself and see if you pass. Now, this is why when we see pictures like these and headlines like these pop up on the media, social media, wherever we see them, that the process itself to legally immigrate into the United States is not that easy. The process itself is more of a deterrent rather than an encouragement. And sometimes people choose to immigrate and jump borders because they're fighting for their lives. So when you can imagine, now I address that I'm very privileged. I had the family support and the resources to help me legally immigrate into this country. But sometimes when you're running for your life, you just don't have the time to pool all of those resources. So that's why when we hear people say something like, why can't they just legally immigrate into the country, that it's not that easy. This is also why it's super important for us as a society to educate ourselves. Because by educating ourselves, we can see that this is not humane. The way we treat these people, we're all human. And by educating ourselves, we can be more compassionate and learn people's stories and see that we are all welcome wherever we want to go. Now, let's go back to my story. Due to my mother moving to the United States, I mostly had a childhood without her. 
My father and my aunts took amazing care of my brother and I, but there were still many parts of my younger self that was just wishing for that good, night, good night's kiss from my mother, a hug from whenever I came back home from school, or you know, just those small daily interactions that you could have around the house. Most of my memories with my mother consisted of Yahoo instant messenger video chats, occasional visits, and the tears that I've cried at the airport cafeteria every time we dropped her off. Here's actually one of those instances in the iconic airport cafeteria. And don't be fooled by that smile over there. I actually cried buckets when we got to the car. I was like, Mom, don't leave me. But it's OK. <laughs> now, let's fast forward to 2009. We went through the process, and we finally made it here. I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember we landed in the John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. And after we got through customs, all I wanted was to see my mom. And when we got to the arrival section, I saw her literally jumping over the fence, and she was like, oh my gosh, I'm here! And then I went to the border, um, I passed the fence, and I remember the hug that my mother gave me. It was one of the biggest ones that she has ever given my brother and I. And then I also remember the high fives I got from my cousin and my uncle, and of course, after we left the airport, we had to celebrate. But after a few days, we started to settle. I started to wonder, what's next? I finally made it here. What do I do now? Now, I grew up and still live in the humble town of Hamden, Connecticut. Hamden is a very diverse town, at least compared to the ones in Connecticut. While I always felt welcomed, I never really fe like, felt like I belonged. There was a lot of things that's making me stand out. And one of those instances where I stood out the most was actually my first day of American school which unfortunately was the second day for everyone else because I had like documentations that stopped me from going in that first day. I know, I didn't want to stand out, but here we are going in for the first day on the second day. So I remember walking up to my school and walking into my classroom and then seeing my teacher's face glow up. She was like, oh my gosh, he's here. So she took me from the door, presented me in front of the classroom, and then said something along these lines like, good morning, everyone. Here's Ramon. Here's our new classmate. He's from the Philippines. And I remember just standing there like an alien being presented in front of my class. I was like, hi, hello. I guess, cool. Now, my class welcomed me, and I had a lot of great time at school, but I always still felt different from the way I carried myself, the way I spoke with my broken English, and the fried rice and spam that I brought in for lunch. Now, if you know, at school, there's one place you don't want to stand out, it's the cafeteria. So I would literally walk in on there every day with my Tupperware, with my rice, and everyone's like, who is that? But being different in many aspects than the rest of my peers made me appreciate my differences. Being different, I appreciated that I have a lot of interesting stories to tell. I have experience living in a different country, and I can also speak two languages, which is low-key a flex. But aside from the fried rice and spam, there was still something that made me feel like I never really belonged. It was something that you couldn't see. It was my beliefs and my values. You see, schools back home are so much more different than the schools that we have here. Back home, you weren't encouraged to have fun. We didn't even have a playground. We barely had a recess. And teachers are allowed to be tough on you. I remember one time I was talking so much, I took a shoe to the head. Yes, teachers could do that in the Philippines. But here, it was so much more different. You were encouraged to have fun. You were supported, and you were encouraged to explore any interests that you may have, whether it be sports, art, music, whatever. Now, I wish that I could just play in the snow all day, and I wish that I could just go to Disney World every day, but there's so many factors that's stopping us from doing that. However, schools in the Philippines also had something different. It was competition. From a young age, you were taught to be better than everyone else, no matter the cost. Now, finally being here in the United States and knowing that the biggest reason of why I came here was to get a better education for a better future, and that one-upping mentality always stuck with me, and it's still with me to this day. When I was at school, I remember I would always be in the playground playing with my friends, but all I can think about is that exam coming the next week. Now let's fast forward to high school, where the pressure just kept on going up. There are always the pressures of maintaining the best GPA, uh, joining clubs to fill up that resume, and all to get to the best colleges in the land. 
Now, getting into college, spoiler alert, that pressure is at the highest that it has ever been. I put all of this pressure onto myself to feel like I can make up for all of the effort that was spent getting me here. Now, I love Bryant, I really do, but unfortunately, Bryant is not easy on the pockets. Now that there's a financial burden tied to academic performance, all of the factors that I just mentioned about is like all I can think about. Now, we all know that saying that goes college is going to be the best four years of your life. However, it's hard to enjoy the best four years of your life when all you can think about is, again, getting those good grades, filling up that resume, and hopefully landing that perfect job offer by the end of all of this so that I can provide for myself and, in turn, give back to my family. Now, don't get me wrong. I may have had a lot of self-imposed pressure, but there is also a lot of external pressures that were put onto me. You see, going to business school was already a big bet for me. Call, uh, business is not the major of choice for most Filipinos. In Filipino culture, you either become a nurse or do something else in the medical field. I remember this one time when I was out to dinner before I was moving into my freshman year here at Bryant, my father and I had this conversation that went something like this. My father went, business? How much money is that going to make you? And then I remember responding, I don't know. <laughs> but what I do know is that there are a lot of opportunities within it. And then my dad goes, okay. With enough doubt to permeate the little atmosphere and vibe that we were having there in the table at that time. During my time at college so far, there has been many times that I have overexerted myself. Not because I didn't want to take time to have fun or take care of myself, but because doing so was selfish in my eyes. I always had thoughts that went into my head that went like, oh, so you want to take a nap? Well, what about that exam you have the next week? If you don't study now, you're going to get bad grades, and there goes your job prospects. Or other thoughts that went like, go join that club and make something of yourself. Now, I may have had a lot of pressure and barriers that has put in front of me, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, self-imposed, external, whatever form it may have taken. However, I did not let those stop me from living my best life. I would not be the resilient, driven, and passionate person that I am today if it were not for, these, for those barriers. They helped motivate me to light a fire under me to be better and to always strive to be the best. Due to the motivation that those barriers have given me, I was able to earn a lot of awards in high school and even get my high school diploma. I was able to get into an amazing university and finally get that good American education that I have been yearning for ever since I was young. Shout out to Brian. And I have even been able to land a very coveted internship in one of the biggest companies in the world. However, this motivation also made me more compassionate. You see, everyone has their own paths and goals in life. Life is not a one-size-fits-all. By embracing our different paths and our different goals, we can actually learn from each other because we can help each other into reaching those, and then we can also listen to others if they need help. We can be more compassionate and also very more empathetic. Now, for those of you watching this talk here in the auditorium today, or for those of you watching online at home, I hope that my talk inspired you to start looking at the barriers that have been put in front of you, not as what they are, not as barriers, but as learning lessons here to make you better. They're only there to make you stronger and to test your strength so that moving forward, you can be a better version of yourself. Next is to never be afraid to be different. Embrace who you are. Whether you're in a room of 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, or a million people, always be proud to be you. One, being one out of seven billion, that should make you proud and happy to be who you are. Having these differences is what makes us human beings shine. Next is to never be afraid to educate yourself. Don't be afraid to engage in the events that are being held in your community. Don't be afraid to ask those tough questions. Don't be afraid to stand up and be an ally. Sometimes all it takes is one spark to ignite others to do the same. And hopefully one day when we continue to spread our wealth of knowledge that we can come to a world where diversity and inclusivity is the law of the land. Lastly, be more grateful. Be grateful for everything and everyone that has gotten you this far in your life so far. Sometimes we can get so caught up in the barriers that life has put in our path that 
we ourselves can be our own barriers from stop, stopping us from reaching our highest potential. By taking the time to reflect and being more grateful, we can see that where we are right now is enough. I am enough. You are enough. We are all enough, and that there's potential in all of us. Now, before I leave, I just wanted to say thank you to my family. I would not be who I am without them. I dedicate this talk to them. Maraming salamat.